Uh, number two, I've had a few people comment to me today. Uh, Tim, I thought you said your mustache and goatee would be back in one week. It is. You can come feel it if you would like. The deal is, the color is different than it was the last time I grew it. <laughs> it's no longer this color, all right? It's now getting to be more this color. So it's there, it's just uh, a lot more pale than it once was. So, um, and again, if you're new today, what's that all about? Uh, we are in the midst of a building project, uh, fundraising. We finished phase one at the end of December, and there was a goal that somebody put out there. If we hit a uh, million dollars of our goal by the end of the year, then I would show up on a Sunday with no facial hair. So that was last Sunday. If you missed it, too bad. All right. <laughs> Uh, there is one more goal out there, all right, that somebody else threw out, and that is if we hit uh, 1.5 by Easter, then I will show up bald. Not on Easter. <laughs> I will not be bald on Easter, all right? Um, and I do want us to hit 1.5, but it's okay if it's the week after Easter, okay? <laughs> or we could do it this way. If you hit 1.5 before Valentine's Day, I won't, sh I won't go bald. That one work? Okay. All right. Anyway, so uh, thank you for that. I'm not saying any more about the building today. If you're new, you want to know more about it, there's a picture out there. There are brochures. There are pledge cards that will answer most of your questions for you on that. All right. Uh, let me direct your attention to the screen and our morning announcements. Good morning, church. If you're a visitor, we would love to hear from you. If you would, please fill out a visitor's card or a connect card that's in the pew. Drop it in the offering. If you have a prayer request or a change of address, it would be helpful for us to know that so we can pray about it at our staff meeting. And we're really glad you're here. If there's anything that we can assist with, please let us know. Ladies, in 2019, we have a book club just for you. This is a great way to meet new friends from here at New Hope or to just hang out and have a good time with the ones you already know. We will offer various times, dates, and locations for these once monthly meetings. So sign up today and tell us what your preference is and we'll get a hold of you. Make sure to read that email so you get all the information you need. See what I did there? See you soon. Ladies, Calvin Crest Retreat is right around the corner. The dates this year are April 5th, 6th, and 7th. The special guest speaker is Jennifer Lord. Her topic will be the road less travel. She's gonna encourage us to live and love like Jesus. And with a last name like Lord, she's probably got some pretty good insights. So you can go online today at calvincrest.com and register so you can be sure to get the room and select your roommate that you'd like to have up there. By the way, on Saturday, they're having a scavenger hunt called Find the Chocolate. I'm not gonna miss out on that. I hope you won't either. See you soon. We'll be starting a seven-week Bible study called the Daniel Plan on January the 16th. This promotes a healthy lifestyle in five areas of our life. Our faith, food, fitness, friends, and focus. We'll be meeting every Wednesday at 7 p.m. We'll watch a short video, and then we'll have time for discussion about what we've learned. There's also a Facebook group. This will be where we can have discussion, sharing, and encouragement for all the people that are participating. What better way to start off 2019 than with a healthy lifestyle? That starts on January 16th at 7 p.m. If you're attending a Bible study on Wednesday nights or your kids are attending the jam session, then you're welcome to come to our family dinners. That starts at 6.15 and it's just an opportunity for everyone on campus to get together and eat. And since we're doing the Daniel Plan study, there will be options available for those that are participating in that. Hope to see you there. We'll be having our monthly men's breakfast on February the 9th. We start with coffee at 7.30 and then we'll eat at 8. So you're welcome to come along, meet other guys in the church, and eat some delicious breakfast. The next jam session begins January 16th for kids preschool through fourth grade. We will be doing various science experiments to help us learn about the great examples of faith that are in the Bible. All children are welcome, and the class will meet from 7 to 8 p.m. on Wednesday nights for the next seven weeks. Our 5th and 6th graders will continue to meet as well at the same time, 7 to 8 p.m., as they do every week. Come join us. With an emphasis on intentional evangelism this year, Pastor Tim wants you to share your testimony. 
To do so, visit us online at www.welovepastortim.com and then, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I meant uh, newhopechurch.net. Once you're on the beautifully designed homepage, scroll down to Salvation Story. Just click there and then fill out the form on the next page. Now, please note, we do need your email address at the bottom, but this is only used to send your form into the office and it's not captured or used in any way. In our office, Angel is sitting by awaiting your salvation story. Now, she'd love to hear from you. So fill that form out today and reflect on how you were brought to Christ. Thanks. All right, so uh, those salvation stories, we would love to hear about them from you. We've received a dozen or so already, and uh, if you don't do email or uh, online stuff, there are some forms in the back on the table as you leave. You can pick one up and hand it in the old-fashioned way. Coming around are the sign-up sheets for uh, the Women's Book Club sign-up. If you didn't sign up last week, would like to be part of a book club, there's going to be 10 or so of them around the city of Fresno and Clovis at different times and different locations and you enjoy reading and getting together with other ladies and meeting new people, this would be a great way to do it. So please fill those out and they'll get you the appropriate information. Um, just thought maybe it was time maybe to give an update on Jam Center. Some of you might be new and wonder when they talk about Jam Sessions on Wednesday night what that is. That's our kids ministry. That front building over there near the playground is called the Jams Center and it really stands for Jesus and me. All right. And that's kind of the name for our kids ministry around here. Those of you who have kids that play in the playground you may notice that the uh, covering has been sagging. Uh, it's a little over 10 years old now and it began to rip out along the wire and that's being replaced this next week. So uh, there'll be a new covering out there. I uh, wanted to give you an update on that. Next week you'll see uh, an announcement. We'll have times, dates, and all of that, but I'm giving you a small heads up. The latter part of February, we will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of Celebrate Recovery here at New Hope Church. It's always a great evening for us to hear the stories and the testimonies of how God has made a transforming difference in the lives of men and women and families who have had hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and they've been ministered to through Celebrate Recovery. There is a need for some additional ushers and greeters and parking posse. And uh, if you would like to serve in any one of those areas, take one of the cards in the pew in front of you, put your name, indicate, hey, I'd be willing to be an usher or a greeter uh, or a member of the parking posse. Uh, parking posse is simply those folks out there in the parking lot who help get traffic in and out more efficiently between our services. Uh, greeters are those who are out by the front door and ushers will be those who will be working a little more inside, all right, as we, uh, as we fill up during our services. So if you'd like to help out a Sunday every now and then, fill out a card, put your name on it, and check off usher or greeter, all right? Um... Prison Fellowship, um, Fred Mendron, who's in our 8 o'clock service. Uh, there's a ministry in the Avenal Prison where they restore old bikes or they take parts off of multiple bikes and create a new one. And then those are recycled back out into a community given to kids who probably otherwise would not get one. So if you have some old bikes, no matter what condition they are in, you have some slightly used bikes. Uh, there's going to be a date posted in the next couple of weeks of what uh, the pickup day will be for that. What you can do is when that date is assigned, bring them here to the church. There'll be a big uh, trailer that you will put those bikes in and then they will be delivered to Avenal Prison for those inmates to be engaged in a worthwhile project and make a difference in the lives of some young children. So uh, we would love for you to help them out in doing that. Um, a couple of prayer requests. Yesterday we had a service here for uh, Jennifer Hutt, just a couple of years younger than I am, died unexpectedly, three grown daughters, 14 grandchildren, and one great grandchild. Uh, she and her sister and brothers grew up in the same church John Longstaff was a part of as a kid and a teenager, and she had stories to tell me about John. Uh, can't wait to pass them on to him. But anyway, would appreciate you remembering to pray for the Hutt family. Uh, next Saturday, 2 o'clock right here is the memorial service for Frank Hicks. 
longtime member of our church, longtime board member here. We want to honor him. So hope you'll be able to come and join us for those honors of Frank and be praying for Bob Batts and his grown kids. Um, Irma McGuinn, as you know, she's been through a lot of treatment up at Stanford for a rare, very rare disease, has been doing very well with the treatment, uh, but she caught that viral thing that's going around. I had it, many of you have had it over these past two months. When you are in a compromised situation like she is, where she's had her complete bone marrow okay, uh, destroyed and, and replaced. Uh, you're a little more susceptible till everything gets built back up. So she spent about four days at Stanford and uh, she is home now. She's going to have to kind of stay away from crowds for a few more weeks. So uh, be praying for her as she goes through this, but she is doing very well. We got great news from Reba Chamberlain who broke her second hip in four months. The bone is healing very well and she can now uh, use it with some weight bearing in her therapy. I got a message this morning that Ken Haynes, normally here in this service, is at Clovis Community Hospital this morning. Uh, has some breathing problems. We'll find out more about it when the service is over, but please be praying for Kent that they get a, a handle on what's going on there. So those are the updates that I wanted to share with you. We're going to pray. Our ushers are going to come wait on us for our tithes and offering, and our worship team is going to come back and engage us in our worship. Thanks for being here this morning. Uh, Mark, yes. how'd that Daniel Plan kickoff night go this last Wednesday? Went very well. We had 105 people, and uh, that was just an intro and uh, Still time next Wednesday. We don't really start the first essential until this Wednesday, so um, come along and join us. Okay, so if you missed last Wednesday, not too late to join them. Uh, and I tell you what, here's the deal with the Daniel plan, guys. We will have more, more room on the pews very soon, all right? <laughs> so that's really exciting, all right? So anyway, let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, I love you so much. It is hard for me to imagine uh, doing life on a daily basis without you. Some days are, are hard days. Some days go exactly the way we plan them. Some days go nothing like we thought they would go. But Father, being able to face the plans or the surprises in the confidence that there is nothing that happens in my life that you don't already know about makes every day a, an exciting adventure. And so thank you. Uh, thank you for the fact that you don't make promises like once we become a Christian, our life will be perfect. You're very straightforward with us. You tell us in this world there will be hard times. But you promise to be our source of strength. You promise to be our peace in the midst of chaos. You promise to be our joy in the midst of hurt. You promise to be our hope in the circumstances of despair. And so, Father, thank you for those things that you bring into our world, that without it, we would be facing all these challenges on our own abilities, resources, strong will, determination. And sometimes we run out of determination. And sometimes our will is broken. But, Father, you, you are never broken. And so thank you for the difference that you make in our lives. We trust you with the needs, Lord, of Irma. We continue to lift her up to you. Lord, for Dan, it's great to see him in church today. Thank you for the strength you're providing. Thank you for the care doctors are giving. Thank you for his airplane ride this week. Thank you for, um, thank you for the love and support he has from his family. And we just continue to lift his needs to you. Dear Lord, for, um, for our Ivory Coast mission trip, two weeks from today, there'll be four of us uh, somewhere between here and Paris, France, on our way to Ivory Coast. Thank you for what you already have planned for us in this adventure and the difference that you want to make in uh, that tiny nation in Africa. And as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through children's ministries, through, through medical treatment, through construction projects, and through the sharing of your gospel. So, Father, may you find us ready, willing, and available for the adventure you have for us. Lord, you know what's going on in the heart and the lives and the circumstances of everyone who's sitting or standing here in this service. We, um, we trust today that as we lift our voices in worship, our attention will be drawn to you. As the scriptures are opened, I hope our attention will be drawn to your word. And then, Father, as by your spirit you bring those words to our heart, may our attention be drawn to obedience and submission to your leadership in our life. For the privilege of giving and sharing today, Father, we say thank you. We trust you for this and so much more. In the name of your Son, our blessed, marvelous, wonderful, incredible Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Amen. Absolutely perfect for the, um, the thrust of evangelism that we're talking about this month. Um, if this is your first Sunday here this year, uh, we're engaged in a theme really throughout the whole year. I'm only preaching on it in the month of January specifically, and then we'll highlight it throughout the year. But uh, we're looking at the subject of evangelism, what it means to share our faith with others, to invite others to make this discovery that Jesus Christ loves them. Uh, he died for them. He rose again and wants to come live in each of us. And so we're talking about what that, what that means and what that looks like. Um, this song was a good reminder for a couple of disclaimers. Sometimes when we talk about in church the subject of evangelism, we use terminology that those of us who've been in church for a while all understand. But if you haven't been in church much, if you're not someone who is a Christian, then it might not make sense. Sometimes we don't even understand what it means to be a Christian. I was born in America, so I must be a Christian. No. The, the Bible's very specific that all of us, whether we're born in America or China or Japan or Iraq or Israel, we were born in this world dead in our trespasses and sins. We were born with physical life, but we were not born with the life of God in us. That is a choice to have a relationship with Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever chooses to believe in Him, eh? will have everlasting life and not perish. So this is a choice relationship. Sometimes in that process, as we talk about one another, we use the term Christian. It doesn't mean a member of a church. It doesn't mean a part of a religious sect or organization. It means that I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Christ in me. Just as it, um, Shelly and I were friends until the day we got married. <laughs> then our names changed. Our names changed. Okay? Our, our relationship changed. We may have been engaged, okay? But we weren't husband and wife until the day we got married. The two become one, inseparable. In a relationship with Jesus, and, 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 and our, our identifying nouns became different. Woman, man. Now it's wife, husband. It's just the fact of reality. So in this relationship with Jesus Christ, there are terms that we often use and we don't think through necessarily when we say it, that sometimes it's, it's hurtful. We refer to people who are not in a relationship with Jesus Christ. and We use the term Christian to define them. We use the term sinner. Now, once we're a Christian, we don't mind being called sinners so bad. <laughs> we understand what it means, but when we don't fully understand that, how dare you call me a sinner? Well, what does sinner mean? Because we always think adulterer, liar, fornicator. We think of all the horrible words. Sinner simply means independent from God. Christian simply means dependent on God. It's a, transi a transition. So sometimes we use the word unbeliever when we're talking about a person who, well, I'm not an unbeliever. I believe in God. You, you very well believe in God, but have no relationship with him. So sometimes we throw these terms out. And so if sometimes in my zealousness of preaching, I throw one of those terms out, I am not intending to be offensive. I understand all that was true about me at one point in time. And the reason that I'm different now and I can be called a Christian is not because I deserve it, not because I was good enough to earn the title, not because I've uh, given enough money to buy the title. It was an act of mercy, as that last song described, an act of mercy of God's loving kindness towards me and that I was willing to say yes to his invitation to enter into a relationship. And, and you can make that same choice. So, that being said, I want to read sort of what our theme passage is for this year, which is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to jump in at verse 14 here in just a moment. I'm going to give you a chance to find it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
beginning at verse 14. There was a little boy who came home from Sunday school. And his mother asked him, who was your teacher? And the little boy replied to his mom, he said, I don't know, but she must have been Jesus' grandmother. All she did was talk about him the whole time. <laughs> I want to suggest to you that the church needs more grandmothers and grandpas in the world today. We need more and more of us who would be willing to talk about Jesus. When we have a grandkid, what do we want to do? Oh, everybody gets to see the best looking grandkid in the world, all right? We show them the picture. We want to talk about them. There's a sense in which those of us who have been privileged enough to enter into this relationship with Jesus Christ and become what the church called in the book of Acts Christians, we need to talk about them. And 2 Corinthians 5 gives us some of the reasons why. Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised again. If we've received this gift of life from Jesus Christ, Paul is simply saying, then why don't we want to share this life with him? So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Don't look at anybody and say they're not worth saving. Don't look at anybody and say they're not worth praying for. Don't look at anybody and say they're not worth me sharing my faith with. I don't care if you voted for Obama or Trump. You don't look at either one of those men and say they're not worth my time to pray for. They are a potential child of God. And God would love to transform their lives into his image. Don't look at anybody. It's what this passage says. Because of what the mercy Christ has shown to you, we look at others differently now. We once regarded Christ in this way. In other words, we used to look at God from a worldly point of view and we didn't think much of him. But we don't do that any longer, Paul said. Therefore, because this is true, if anyone is in Christ, that's what it means to be a Christian, in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation to all of us. This is not written to the pastors. This is written to the church. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Listen to this. This is the good news. Not counting men's sins against them. Isn't it good to know you don't have to have your junk counted against you? Your screw ups, your mess ups. He doesn't hold it against us. Why? Because Jesus took all that on himself on the cross. All our mess ups. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. He is. We are the walking advertisement of Jesus Christ in the world. We implore you, Paul says, on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So that in him, you and I could become the righteousness of God. I've gone from being fool's gold to the real thing. 14 carat. Not because I deserve it, but because of the love of God that was compellingly given to me. What I want to do today, and I found out in the last service next Sunday as well, <laughs> is I want us to look at the mindset of sharing our faith. And then I want us to discover how we take that mindset and we put it into practice in our everyday life. As individuals, all of us as part of the body of Christ, doing this as Paul talks about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Listen to one pastor's confession. He said, I am quite possibly the world's most timid evangelist. I don't wake up in the morning thinking, maybe I'll get to share the gospel today. I know a few people like that, and that's wonderful. That's just not me. Not even a little. When I really sit down and think about my hesitancy, though I realize I'm being silly, why should I be afraid to share the gospel, the good news? 
The greatest news anybody could ever hear, actually. Why wouldn't I want to share all that I believe is offered is forgiveness, a great relationship with God. We offer eternal life through the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. After all, as a Christian, I believe all this is very important. Some of my nervousness about sharing my faith comes from bad experiences that I've had. I've tried telling non-Christian family members about Jesus. But rather than engage in the conversation, they simply nod at me and then they ignore me. I've had people dismiss everything I've had to say. I've been told that if I don't lead at least five people to Christ every year, I'm not doing my duty as a Christian. I've even tested out the idea that we can share the gospel just by the way we live our lives. Hadn't worked. In the end, I had neighbors who thought I was a really nice guy, but they didn't learn one thing about Jesus at all. And yet, I don't use my timidity as an excuse for not sharing my faith anymore. I can't ignore the Bible clearly says that we are all called to be ambassadors. In fact, I'm more confident than ever that I not only can, but must share the good news to those who are around me. So what's changed in my perspective? Why am I a spectacular failure as an evangelist? Listen to this interesting confession from a pastor. To date, I don't know if through my efforts I've actually led a single person to Jesus. But I'm not discouraged because I finally learned some things about evangelism and the good news about results. So what did that pastor learn? Well, I'm going to tell you. There's five things that he learned, five perspectives about evangelism that has reshaped his mindset. Number one, evangelism is aiming to persuade. In recent years, it's grown increasingly common for corporations to retain what they call in their employ brand evangelists. Did you know that? They're companies, they hire position titles called brand evangelists. These are men and women who passionately advocate, advocate for a certain product and try to get the community to buy into their platform of belief. Whoever that is for the Gillette Corporation should be fired this week. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Google it. Uh, I'll never buy a Gillette razor again. Their goal, brand evangelist goal, is to persuade you that the thing they're passionate about is something that you should be passionate about too. Really, Christians are not so different when it comes to talking about Jesus. It's no wonder that Max Stiles, who was a pastor in Iraq, after formerly being the CEO of Gulf Digital Solutions, isn't that a big jump? CEO of Gulf Digital to a pastor in Iraq. That is amazing. And he defines evangelism as teaching the gospel with the aim to persuade. With their words, with our words, we Christians seek to convince those who don't believe about the truth of the gospel. We hope that through this process, friends, family members, and even strangers will come to new life in Jesus Christ, discovering a renewed sense of joy, purpose, and contentment. With that being said, the second discovery about evangelism is it's not a sales pitch. Though we do engage in evangelism with the idea to persuade, this is not a sales pitch. Evangelism, despite many Christians' well-intentioned but misguided attempts to treat it as such, is not a sales pitch. No Christian should present their faith as a guarantee of health, wealth, and great relationships. We are never to make shallow claims about the gospel. During my early days at Fresno Bible House, it was, uh, it was on the rise and at the peak of the name it, claim it, all right, movement in, in our country and in our world, all right? I'm so glad we've gotten sort of past the peak. It's still out there. But when people distort the message of the gospel, they also confuse people about what a relationship with Jesus Christ is. We do not try to convince people to believe in Jesus because if you believe in Jesus, all your sicknesses will be healed, all your financial worries will be eradicated, and all your relationships will be perfect. I could probably do a survey right now 
And I could ask how many of you have been perfectly healthy ever since the day that you became a Christian? <laughs> Probably no hands going up. I just told somebody today, they asked me how I was feeling. I said, you know what? It just dawned on me a little bit ago. I feel great today. It's the first day in about 45 days. I haven't either had a cough, chest congestion, um, abdominal junk, or gout. <laughs> All that's gone. It's great. I feel good today. I might preach for an hour today. <laughs> People are saying, Lord, strike him down. Give him a sickness again. <laughs> the, Bi the Bible doesn't promise that. And, and, and to, to try to do that is to make a sales pitch to convince people that, you know, hey, when they buy this vacuum cleaner, you will never have to vacuum your house again. <laughs> hey, no, that's, that, that's not true. If we, if we tell people, hey, if you become a Christian, all your financial worries will go away. No. Hopefully you will learn principles from the scripture of how to handle your money better than you did on your own and things will get better, but, but it just doesn't fall from the sky. Hey, all of your relationships will be perfect. Do you know the divorce rate inside the church is only 1% less than outside the church? Why? Because we're messy people. Even when we're saved, we're still messy people. But what we do have is a resource bigger than ourselves to go with us through those messy times in our life. But we need to be careful that we don't make shallow claims about the gospel just to sell somebody something. If we think of evangelism as nothing more than a sales job where the prospect is to be won over, to sign on a dotted line by praying a prayer followed by the assurance that they are now the proud owner of salvation, then we've missed the point. This is not a sales pitch. This is a relationship. And although the promise of a better life sounds nice, it's a promise we simply cannot keep. I've often said to young couples who've come through my office for premarital counseling, is I don't care how long you've dated and I don't even care if you've lived together. Well, I do care, but even if you have lived together. Most people do not show their real selves until after the wedding day. We put our best foot forward before the commitment has been made. And then we discover after the commitment has been made that that best foot is an artificial limb. It's not the real you. And then we wonder why those marriages don't last very long and it's because there's a lack of trust. Because there wasn't absolute honesty on the front end. And that same thing often happens when we try to treat evangelism like a sales pitch. I often know people who when they become Christians, things got worse before they got better. Because Satan ignored you before you became a Christian. He didn't care because he already had you. Once you become a Christian, now he wants to discourage you and sink you into a pit of despair. And the pressure often gets worse. We must remember that when we are saved by Jesus Christ, we are saved into a life like His, one that inevitably will be marked by both hardship and blessing. Christianity is not a free pass out of difficult times, and, it's meaning and, meaning, and it is misleading and destructive to present it as such. Number three, evangelism is simply telling people the truth. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's still true. What we win them with we win them too. Our aim in evangelism is not to entice people with tales of earthly delight or even with a trite promise of eternity in heaven. Our aim is to tell them the truth. And what is the truth we need to tell people? That all of us were born independent of God. That's what sin is. And that independence, that sin, will be judged by a holy God. There is no way for us to earn or buy our forgiveness through efforts or money. God, through His mercy, sent His one and only Son to live the perfect life so He could be the perfect sacrifice to provide for us victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. Jesus' sacrifice offers to us forgiveness, and with that comes a redeemed standing, a right standing with God as part of His family. As Christians... Christ lives in us, and we are being transformed to be like Him. And someday, 
Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. And on that day, all who believe in him will join God in this new creation, a creation forever free from sin and sadness and death. Those are not always easy things to share with folks. You can see why we don't win a lot of popularity contests. But as Pastor Mark Deaver wrote, when we tell the gospel to people, we need to tell them honestly the truth. To hold back important and unpalatable parts of the truth is to begin to manipulate and try to sell a false bill of goods to the person with whom we're sharing. So however we evangelize, we aren't to hide problems, we aren't to ignore our own shortcomings or failures, we aren't to deny difficulties, and we are not to put forward only positives that we imagine our non-Christian friends presently value and present God as simply the means by which they can meet or achieve their own ends. We must be honest. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not finished with the message, but I'm going to do something very different right here. This is a subject on evangelism and a mindset for us as the church to develop so that we communicate with others this truth. In the process of doing that, I've explained what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it dawned on me yesterday, wouldn't it be kind of silly to have gone through all of that and there may be somebody sitting right here in the pew who came to church today not knowing why? Being told, being shared with, how the love of God compels us to share this truth with others, and then we don't give you a chance to invite Jesus Christ to come live in your life. Usually we do that at the end of a sermon, but I'm going to pause right here. And I'm not going to ask you to step forward. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But, but if, you, if you arrived here today, friends invited you, 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 you were a drive-by, which is what we often get on a card. How'd you hear about New Hope? Drove by. This is the healthy kind of drive-bys. We don't mind. Maybe you've recently attended a wedding here or a funeral here. That's the second and third most frequent responses we get. But, but something brought you here today, and maybe it was to hear a very clear, simple, direct, I believe very truthful expression of what it means to be a Christian. And maybe you're ready to make that choice in your life. So I'm going to ask everybody to bow your heads with me for just a moment. You can use your own words. There's no fancy formula or special prayer. Or maybe you want to take the words I'm about to pray and make them your own. But you want to invite Christ to come live in your life. Then let's pray. Father, I love you. Dear Jesus, I'm not even sure why I showed up today. But I'm here. and There's been something nagging and gnawing at me for a while. and I'm here today and it's been very clear what a relationship with you is like. I've I, I, I've always believed in you, but I've never trusted you. I've, I've, I've given you thoughts, but I've never given you my life and didn't understand what it meant to not believe and to believe, what it means to be a non-Christian and to become a Christian. And today I may not understand it all, but I have a better, better sense than I did before. And God, I want to invite you to come live in my life. I want to thank you that you've forgiven me of my sin. I want you to come live in my life. I don't want to be independent from you anymore. And though I don't understand what all the implications are going to be from this day forward, I want to learn more about you. I want to grow in a relationship with you. And I want to know that you are my God and I am your child. I want to know that when I die, I get to go to heaven. And I want to know, Father, that between now and the time that I go to heaven, that your son, the Lord Jesus, is going to live in my life. Thank you very much. I look forward to knowing you better in the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't have to tell a soul if you've done that. The only one who needs to know is God. But if down the road you would like some material or some additional help or what the next steps are, give us a call here at the office. Take a card in the pew. Put your name on it with a contact number. Indicate, hey, I prayed today. Somebody will follow up with you. But no, if you prayed that prayer, you are no longer a non-believer. You're a believer. You're no longer a sinner. You're a Christian. It's that simple. It's not, it's not complicated. It's, it's not easy. But it is simple. Number four, evangelism is an act of love. Paul said the compelling love of Christ. Some of you might be familiar with a video that's been floating out there for a couple of years now. Uh, in it, Penn Jillette. Is that a name any of you recognize? P Penn Jillette is a comedian used to be Penn and, yeah, Penn and Keller. Uh, he's an avowed atheist. 
Okay, he's been very upfront about that, all right? But this is pretty interesting. In this little video clip, this committed atheist shares how a man came to him after one of his, after one of his uh, shows and shared very kindly, very lovingly the gospel with him. Gillette was not convinced, but he was touched. And what he, while he could have ridiculed the man, Gillette instead saw in this exchange an act of love and he even offered a stern rebuke to other Christians who don't evangelize. Here's the key quote out of that, and then I'll share the bigger context. He said, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them about it? Here's the quote in its entirety. Gillette said, I've always said I don't respect people who don't proselytize. That's people outside the church's term for evangelism. Okay, proselytize, to steal them from one belief system to another. The church uses the word proselytize when Baptists steal the assembly of God sheep, all right, and the Lutherans steal the Presbyterian sheep, all right. They call that proselytizing, all right, but uh, this, this is what an atheist would say when you're going to take a person from being of no faith to a person of faith, you proselytize. So he said, I've always said I don't respect people who don't do that. I don't respect at all that if you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life and you think that it's not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think people shouldn't proselytize and who say, just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that truck was going to hit you, there is a certain point where I would tackle you and what you're talking about is more important than that. Wow. <laughs> Challenging from an atheist. Important reminder. Evangelism is an act of love. J.I. Packer, author and theologian, said evangelism is the enterprise of love. We tell people about Jesus because we want them to know him. We tell people how their relationship with God can be restored because we want it to be restored. We warn people about wrath, judgment, and hell because we don't want anybody to experience those things. And hopefully we do it clearly and helpfully and truthfully and kindly and lovingly, not with condescension or arrogance or cruelty. And number five, evangelism is not to be feared. Some time ago, there was a documentary that featured some pretty unusual ideas about evangelism. A so-called evangelist boldly proclaimed that she could get anybody anywhere to come to Christ. Her attitude was smug and self-serving. Unfortunately, she seemed far more concerned about getting notches in her evangelism belt than she did with accurately proclaiming the gospel. I have to fight various wrong mindsets like this nearly every time I share the gospel of Jesus with somebody. When I was doing a lot of hospice work with Heinz Hospice, one of the challenges I had in meeting brand new families in a, a difficult situation was, was overcoming some of the previous abuse at the hands of Christians who would come in and gather around their loved one's bed and they would pray for them. And, and then when they didn't get healed, they would say, well, you know, she hasn't confessed all of her sins yet. Or it's because those of you standing with us, you don't have enough faith. I hate those things. And so sometimes we find ourselves being influenced or taught about evangelism and no wonder we don't want to do it. What if I do something wrong? What if people don't respond? What if, what if, what if? But here's the truth. The what ifs really don't matter. If it's the compelling love of Christ driving us with this incredible truth, we don't need to fear men. They're usually not going to hurt us. And even if they do, can they take our eternal salvation away from us? No, they might take our momentary life, but so what? I'm going to heaven. We don't need to be concerned about what to say always because the Holy Spirit will prompt us and guide us. We don't need to get caught up in results. We're not responsible for the results. We're responsible for sowing seeds. We shouldn't be surprised when things get difficult. Jesus has promised that these times will come and will be rewarded and persevere through the trials. When we understand this, then we realize that results don't depend upon us. We don't have to worry about messing up. Evangelism suddenly gets a whole lot less scary. 
All right, those are the five things that we need to allow to shape our mindset of evangelism. I'm just going to briefly touch on moving from mindset to practice, and then we'll jump into this more fully next week. One of my favorite movies is um, Field of Dreams. But what's true about baseball fields is not true about the church. If you build it, they will come. I know I probably should say it is because we're trying to build a new building, but it, it, that, that's, that's, not, that's not true. It isn't true, and it shouldn't be true. I'll be honest with you. Most, most unbelievers, most unchurched people have no interest in joining us on a Sunday. I didn't say all. I just simply said most. Simply offering a good product is not enough in a post-Christian world. I don't care how cool your venue is. Ours isn't all that cool. We're a country-looking church. You want to know interesting thing about that? Some of you are sitting in here. You are the very ones. You're under 30, under 40. And some of you have said to me, Tim, the reason we chose New Hope, it's the first church we came to that looked like a church. But we can get cool venues. We can have uncool venues. That's, that, that, they don't come necessarily for the venue. It's not the primary source. Okay? Good music is always nice. It's not the fault. People don't come here for a concert. They don't come here for how good the coffee is that we serve in the pavilion. Though I hope you found it better recently. We've changed. <laughs> and you certainly don't show up based upon how hip the pastor dresses. <laughs> Most unbelievers who do show up are there because somebody in that congregation has befriended them and invited them outside the walls of the building. Most outsiders aren't waking up on a Sunday morning saying, ha! I wonder what coffee they're serving today. I'm going to check it out. I bet the music's great. I'll go visit. As pastors, we have two important priorities in what we do. Is leading our church in evangelism and being engaged in shepherding the flock. It's a challenge sometimes to stay balanced. Shepherding is caring for the members. Sometimes y'all can be a pain in the butt. <laughs> that is a universal y'all, not you specifically, all right? Here's the challenge. I've, I've been convinced over the years that I've done this is that one of the reasons shepherding gets very hard is because that's where you're focusing all your attention, not just as a pastor, but as a church. Isn't it interesting when you're a grandparent and your kids are giving you grandbabies in a hospital? Your joints don't hurt too bad to get in the car and go to the hospital and wait for that grandbaby to show up. Your aches and pains aren't near as serious when they want to bring the grandbaby over for you to hold. Isn't it interesting when there's new life around, we feel much better? Same thing is true in church life. When our attention is focused on brand new believers who are discovering Christ and helping them grow up and mature in their faith, our frustrations become much, much smaller. But when we're focused on ourselves, our circumstances become much, much bigger. But if a church is to flourish, it must maintain an appropriate balance of caring for each other and bringing about new life. What we're going to look at next week, it's not really brand new. It's just a little different. There have been primarily two types of evangelism that have been used for the last couple of centuries. One is called event evangelism, and the other one is cold call evangelism. Events are things like a Billy Graham crusade, a Luis Palau event. Those are good. We've participated in all of them, and I always will every time they come through. The other is the uh, kind where you go door to door, just pounding on doors, and kind of like, kind of like a salesman. And there are, there are benefits from both. There are also challenges to both. But the one I think that's been around ever since the first century church, the results are not as fast and they're not as glamorous, but I think they are the most effective. It's what Lee Anderson called about 40 years ago when he wrote a book called Friendship Evangelism. The terminology that they're using today is network evangelism. Network evangelism is not a program. It's not something you can do on a Tuesday night at 6 p.m. only. Network evangelism is a lifestyle. 
You've heard it here before. You've heard Mark preach on it. Before that, you heard Sperling preach on it. You've heard me preach on it. Loving, how do we love our neighbors? How do we use our home and our house and our neighborhood and our, our regular contacts? How do we show love to our neighbors so that they want to know who Jesus Christ is? So let me just uh, wrap this up with this thought. You're saying, Tim, well, I don't have that much contact with other people. How am I going to have people I can lead to Jesus? Let me just highlight five things. You have a family network. There's not very many Rebas out there. Reba Chamberlain, lady that Shelly and I have been helping to, to care for. She's 93 years old. She's outlived her entire family. Okay. She has a niece and a nephew back east she hasn't seen in 25 years. Apart from that, all of her siblings are gone. Parents are gone. No children. That's it. There are very few of those. Most of us have a family network. All of us have a geographical network. The neighborhood we live in. The community we hang out in. We have a vocational network. People at your workplace. Some of you are saying, Tim, let's me out on that one. I'm retired. No, that doesn't let you off the hook. You are now a member of AARP network, all right? So there are people there. You go to McDonald's for breakfast five days a week. There is your vocational network. You have recreational networks, the people that you hang out with and you do your hobbies with, whether it's from, what's that card game? Bunko? Is that a card game or a dice game? That's a dice game. Yeah, only sinners play with dice. Um, just, 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 just kidding. kidding. That's a joke. That is a joke. We have recreational networks, all right? And then we have commercial networks. People that you see in the stores and the shops that you go to. Stop buying on Amazon all the time. Go out and meet people. Okay? And so next week, we will look a little more closely at these networks. And then we will look at five things that we can do to make a difference inside those networks, to be engaged in this thing called being an ambassador of reconciliation to those who are in the world. Let's pray. Father, thanks for the challenge that you're giving to us here at New Hope at the beginning of this year. An opportunity for us to share our faith stories with each other, opportunity to be challenged about sharing this life that you have been so gracious to share with us, with others who were around us, to put out in front of us again the importance, the value, the significance of, of no matter who we are, how long we've been a Christian, what our personality style is like, that being your goodwill ambassador is our wonderful privilege. Yes, there is a responsibility to it, but when we see the value to it, that responsibility becomes a privilege. And so, Father, I just trust that you're going to give us eyes to see more clearly with. You're, you're going by your, your spirit in us. You're going to give us an excitement that overcomes our nervousness and our fear. And, Father, I, I say thanks. I have no idea if in the earlier prayer someone invited Jesus in their life. But thank you that you were listening for any one voice to call out to you. We know that last weekend... We had one of our teenagers invite Jesus Christ in their life at winter camp. And we know we had one, one lady invite Jesus Christ in her heart in our second service last week. That's exciting. New life. And Father, we trust that they are just the beginning of what you will do through the membership and through the friendships of folks here at New Hope. We commit this to you in the awesome name of your son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. And amen. God bless you guys. We'll have a good afternoon.